And yet, he struggled with faith even before his mother died, which was a very painful turning point. Yes, I, th I think the loss of his mother was very influential in his loss of faith. It didn't happen right at that point, but he prayed for her to be healed. And when she wasn't, he just kind of, later on he said he forgot about the magician sort of God that he had prayed to. Because his prayer wasn't answered. Because it wasn't answered. And, and later on he had difficulties in prayer. You know, he had been taught that um, you should feel everything that you're praying. So when you're praying the Lord's Prayer in your private devotions, you know, if you don't feel each line appropriately how you should feel, you know, contrition when you're asking for forgiveness and that sort of thing, that you should go back and start it all over again. Well, that really led to a lot of <laughs> psychological sort of mental problems with the faith. And so later on when he found out there were other belief systems out there, he kind of gladly gave up his Christianity for a time. But God didn't give up on him. No, thankfully, no. thankfully not. He would become, what did he call himself, the most reluctant convert in all of England? Yes, yes, he came kicking and screaming uh, into the kingdom, he said. But his book, his testimony was surprised by joy. Yes, that He's experience of joy and, and longing for something not achievable in this world, eventually led him back to God. Also, his keen sense of reasoning. You know, he was so honest in his pursuit of truth that he didn't remain an atheist for long and eventually came back to faith in, in God and then faith in Jesus as the Son of God. And in one sense, I guess we can be thankful for the influence of World War II Oh my goodness. I forgot. Now this is a replica of an actual newspaper from uh, Wednesday, June 19, 1940. Battle of Britain. Uh, let all the children go to safety. I don't know how many in total were evacuated from the London area to thousands and thousands. the country to be safe. I forgot that these two bachelors took in how many children? Oh, three or four, and, and I think they took in different ones at different times. But starting uh, when England declared war in September 1939, they almost immediately had children into their home. And that's when Lewis began writing The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. That's where Edmund and Peter came from. Yes, yes. Yes, wonderful. His name, Jack. He was Clive Staples Lewis. But obviously very early, he wasn't happy with that name. Well, would you be if your name was Clive Staples? I don't know. It's a little A lot of people pompous, are named Clive, but Staples, I mean, really. <laughs> so at four, he decided he was going to be called Jack. And I tell two stories in the book, uh, one that Doug Gresham tells and, and another told by a second cousin of C.S. Lewis. Um, the second cousin told me that there was a, a train car conductor named Jacksey that C.S. Lewis was fond of. And one day he came home and said, I is Jaxie, and refused to answer to anything else. The story that Doug Gresham tells is, is that there was a dog that he was fond of, a little puppy who was Jaxie. And the dog died, and then C.S. Lewis came home and said, I is Jaxie. I don't know, maybe the two stories are connected. Maybe the dog was run over by the by trolley the car. By the tram car. I don't Ooh. know, but... Well. But he Whatever Jack. the reason, he said, I is Jacksy, and then that was later shortened to Jax and then Jack. Oh, two, two slices of the heart of the man. In one letter written in 1955, he says, <clears throat> We had our first frost last night. Mm. This morning the lawns are all gray with a pale, bright sunshine on them. Wonderfully beautiful and somehow exciting. The first beginning of the winter always excites me. It makes me want adventures. Yes, yes. You don't think of a professorish guy being that playful, but he had to be. Oh, he was so in touch with his own childhood, I think. And only for a brief time as a teenager did he give up reading the books he had read as a child. But later on, he came back to them, you know, and, and even read children's books as an adult that he had never read as a child, like the, the books of E. Nesbitt, mm. uh, you know, Five Children and It and The Aunt and Amabel. And, and some of the things in Narnia come out of those books. Mm. Oh, we have some pictures and I almost forgot. Oh. Um, so let's just look at them. We'll tell you what they are as we see them because our time is racing. Oh boy, Stone Table had to come from this family trip. 
Yes, and, and many people don't realize that, but that's a picture of a dolmen, which was an entrance to an ancient burial ground, and these dolmens dot the landscape around Ireland, and dolmen means stone table, so that's where he got the idea. Now that's your wife, Becky, yes. and your three sons who are friends of Narnia. Oh, absolutely. What are their names? James and Jonathan and Joshua, and they're much bigger now than in that picture. Now this, look at this handsome Jack. Yes, yeah, C.S. Lewis, Lewis, 19 years old. He's only 19, he looks older than that. Yes, oh, and that's the C.S. Lewis centenary statue outside of um, Belfast, near Lewis's birthplace. There, uh, Jack and Warney, his brother, now, with their father. Now what was Warney's real name? Warren. Warren. Warren Hamilton Lewis. On the left, dad in the middle, and there's C.S. Lewis on yes. the right. He looked more like his mother, I thought. Yes, in some ways. Um, and, and they weren't really close to dad, and that became a, a more of an estrangement after mom died. Yes, well, any husband, you know, losing a wife like that to cancer, uh, difficult, difficult Very time. difficult time. Oh, what else do we have? Oh, this is one of the universities. Yes, that's at Oxford. That's uh, new buildings at Magdalen College, Oxford, where Lewis spent uh, about 30 years. Wow. Cambridge as well. Mm-hmm. Oh, keep going, keep going. I think we have more. Don't we have more? I think we do. Oh, Joy Davidman. Yeah, I want to talk about this. This this picture we took, actually, in the pub. Um, Joy is the American woman, Jewish. Uh, she became a Messianic Jew. She yes. became a believer, very influenced by C.S. Lewis's writings. He did marry her. She wasn't really warmly accepted by the Inklings. Well, that's true. She was an American. She was from the Bronx. She was outspoken. You know, <laughs> Oxford was a male bastion at the time. Yes, it was difficult for them to accept a her. Tough fit. Do you know what I wondered just this morning? I'm sure it was just this morning. He was so wounded by the loss of his mother. It was it, almost a derailment of faith for him. And in bringing in God permitting him to open his heart to this love of his life. And then, of course, she had cancer. But there mm. was a mercy. Uh, the, the magician, you know, I just think of the, the book, did grant a reprieve, more time, uh, and, and uh, I guess it went into remission, the cancer. Yes, they married uh, in hospital. She was dying, and... Uh she had a miraculous healing, and they lived together as husband and wife for three or four years. Three or four more years. I wonder how important it was for his heart to revisit that old wound and that old loss through this experience. Oh, I think absolutely, and of course he wrote about it in that wonderful book, A Grief Observed. I think he had that personal relationship with Jesus Christ at the end of his life that helped him to cope. Oh boy, you know, we have just a couple of minutes. Have we used all the pictures? Have we? One more. One more. Oh, there's one more? Okay, now this is just this, we took this picture, and I know it's a little flashy, but um, uh, can you see CSU? Yes, that's the signatures of the Inklings. Uh, yeah. That was a letter written to a fellow who used to live very near where I live in uh, Virginia. He lived in Franklin, West Virginia, of all places. You wrote a book before this called uh, Mere. Theology. Tying into the mere Christianity yes, title yes. of C.S. Lewis. Uh, you are still so passionate about this man. What has he done to you, for you? What influence has he been on Will? Well, I think one of the greatest influences was when I was in college and uh, having a lot of intellectual questions about the faith. I'd grown up in a Christian home. I'd seen the power of Christ at work in people's lives. But I had a lot of intellectual questions that C.S. Lewis, especially through mere Christianity, helped to uh, answer. So mm -hmm. C.S. Lewis didn't bring me to faith, but he kept me in the faith. Mm. Wonderful writing. Um, oh, I had there, and I think I've just lost the page again, um, how he described himself to the grade five children, and it wasn't very flattering. Oh, they asked, what, what do you look and sound like? This is from fifth graders in Maryland. C.S. Lewis's answer in 1954 was, I'm tall, fat, rather bald, red-faced, double-chinned, <laughs> black-haired, have a deep voice, and wear glasses for reading. That sounds like the description of somebody who was very comfortable in his own skin. 